So once again, my name is Charles Calloway. I'm the Continuing Community and Organizer at WEAC. I've been working here for about 13 years. I've been doing this movie series for about nine, eight, nine years. Um, the movie that we're going to be showing tonight is really about gentrification and, and climate justice, environmental justice, kind of all wrapped up in one. Uh, we saw the film way back in June and thought this would be a great idea for our summer's movie series. Um, in saying that, uh, I once again I'd like to welcome you guys out here. Um, so, when we look at this film, and we can't, we usually do a question and answer, answers afterwards, but since it's a nighttime and I know that people want to get out of here after the movie finish, we're going to do it tonight. So, from left to right, I'd like you to introduce yourself, tell me where you're from, and then we can get started with the first question. Dante Clark from the San Francisco Bay Area, California. Good evening, everyone. My name is Manny Martinez. I'm the resident council president for Cypress Maker Houses and Heights Development. Um, my name is Derek Perkinson. I'm the New York City field director for the National Action Network, and I am a member of Manhattan Community Board 10. So we have a lot of people from New York City, some people from California, welcome. Um, my first question is, how would you define identification and what would you say are the main driving factors in identification? Who would like to take that question on first? Derek don't like to share the mic. It's going to be a rough night. So I spell my name differently. Um, gentrification. Um, you know, Charles had us do a lot of homework on this. Um, it's it's a process of neighborhood change that includes economic change in the historical divested neighborhood by main, means of real estate investment and newer higher income residents moving in, as well as democratic dem, okay. demographic change, not only in terms of income level, but also in terms of changes in education level, racial makeup of the uh, residents. It's three key issues to gentrification historic conditions, investment and policy decisions, and community impact. So gentrification, when I think about gentrification, and I want to be clear with folks who are at risk of displacement because of gentrification, that the term has its definition built in. It's a process of development only for the upper classes. Gentry is a part of the word gentrification. So it gentrifies a place. That means bringing in the upper classes, literally the gentry, into places and displacing low-income, working class, usually, if not always, people of color. At least that's true in the U.S. and in New York. And so there is a grave difference between gentrification and community development. Gentrification and development are not synonymous. We can demand community development for our communities without relying on large developers, corporate developers, who will only, who are only looking out for their own interests and their own bottom line. And gentrification only benefits the wealthy classes. There is no benefiting for working class communities. That is not to say that we cannot or are not capable of developing our own Anyone down here? Uh, I'm still learning and exploring this idea of gentrification, but from my experience, I see it as uh, a mentality that's based in white supremacy. Um, those who have positions of power economically, politically, or socially can say what happens to a particular piece of land if you don't have any ownership of it. Us low income, we probably don't own the places that we say. So those who are in power can look and say, I want to do something there. Um, we need to get them up out of there. 
Um, so I look at the police force as also a hand in that from gang enhancement laws that's, that, that, that's mostly enforced upon people of color to come up in there, arrest people, get people up out of there. So then when it's time to come back, there is nothing to come back to because those houses have now been bought and they're now being redeveloped at a price that you can no longer afford. And so that's from my experience from identifying what gentrification is in my community. Yes. Um Gentrification, we, we have to also take in consideration that the areas that are being gentrified were redlined up here in the north and segregated Jim Crow down south. This is a repopulation of these areas with an affl uh, affluential and um, the social race, right? Because that's what it is. It's a social structure race. But we're bringing, they're coming back. They're not coming back. Their family members are coming back. Their generations are coming back. They're still keeping their assets and their equity where they are. Some in our area, some of them moved to Long Island and and, and, Roch, and Westchester and, and and some more more of the affluent places up there. Now their family members, their grandkids and their children are coming back to repopulate our area and displace us. So we have an aggression that's coming on upon us that is not new to us. Just because, there's a, just because there's a new name, it's not a new game, and it's not new players. So that that's what gentrification really is. Charles, let me just add, uh, I think that also what you find is not only that, uh, that piece in terms of what has happened to political power, uh, is there's that shifting of power unfortunately to those who are coming in who are defining what the institutions will be and in that sense that whole repopulation and displacement piece really involves uh, an attempt to shift the cultural the racial the economic composition of a neighborhood so in my next question um, and as we look at gentrification what are the roles that you think government should be playing in that, and how can we uh, move uh, that forward to benefit us? Gotcha. And this is not this is not the time, sir. Gotcha. Not something. Right. Gotcha. Right. gotcha. Yeah, government. Does anyone want to take on that government. question? I can respond. Okay. I would say local government, particularly representatives of neighborhoods within cities, our council members have the responsibility to represent their constituents' needs and not to create policy or make it easy for private interests, private investors to benefit from policies. So when we hear about rezoning proposals for neighborhoods, that is a big red flag for communities. Rezonings can be something that is community initiated, but it is often a process initiated by private developers to allow for the development of luxury condos or luxury hotels or luxury businesses. And so when there is a rezoning proposal, it is a really depressing statistic to hear that 99% of rezoning proposals get approved by the New York City Council. And we had this experience in our own community uptown when Idanis Rodriguez had the, had the power to say no to a rezoning uptown in Inwood, and there was an overpouring of community demand on this city council member, on the council member that represents my neck of the woods, to say no to the rezoning. City, sorry, residents of the community came out at every hearing regarding this rezoning proposal, and there was a resounding demand from the community to please vote no on the rezoning proposal and he voted yes anyway and a lot of private um, developers pay into a pool of money that actually goes to supporting the president I'm sorry the council members um, re-election process so that's another thing to keep in mind when, when thinking about why politicians that are elected by us actually make decisions against us that are not in our favor. The experience, the experience on 125th Street and that rezoning, 
mirrors what took place in your community. And it is not for the lack of community involvement. As a matter of fact, the commitment to the community, to that process, really has made uh, the whole process not only not transparent, but almost illegitimate. Yeah, but I can also respond to that. and throughout the country, and now public housing has fallen upon itself. We have mold, we have lead, we have a whole host of issues. Uh, the Bronx right now is, the asthma rate in the Bronx right now is eight times higher than the national average, and that has to do with NYCHA developments and the people, the population that's in NYCHA developments in the Bronx. Um, 20 years without having any funding to do any modernization of new pipes, new cabinets, um, new rules, it's going to lead to this. It's going to lead to the mold and the lead. This is by design. And now when we look at it today, and we see what's happening today, the piece that NYCHA plays, 177,000 units in New York City, once that gets privatized, that's going to kick off gentrification in New York City at a velocity that has never been seen before in any part of the country. We have the, the our political representation is aiding this. Our mayor has turned Gracie Mansion into a brokerage firm and has turned every politician, state, federal, and local, into real estate brokers, into real estate agents, rather. And so this is what this is. Politicians respond to money. We have 75 billionaires who live in New York City. Not, not too long ago, last summer, the mayor had a hundred and close to 140 meetings with lobbyists and 36 of them were um, real estate lobbyists. And we had some of the private management companies who's taken over some of these developments who were being represented by those lobbyists that was sitting down with the mayor. It's evident, it's in our faces, but they, they throw it around so that we can't see it. It's like a puzzle that we have to piece together. We have to pay attention. They're taking it, they're working against us. All right, thank you so very much. Uh, anybody else want to respond? So, my other question is, um, in your organizations that you work for, because you all represent an organization, I would like to know what kind of things that you're doing around education and environmental justice that we can all grab a hold on to and to help us uh, help this battle. Yeah, um, over at NAN, I've, I've engaged with a coalition that's around environmental justice, uh, around the Green New Deal. And this is about the emissions in the environment, how the uh, global warming is affecting, and it's, it's happening on multiple levels in our community. So we have to stay diligent on that. Um, we also... Uh,
So I believe that's at, at the organization I work with, with the Rise Center back in uh, Richmond, California. Uh, this documentary, uh, well, which is called A Political Comedy, The North Pole, is our way of highlighting this is what gentrification looks like. This is what it feels like. And this is what we could do about it to protect each other in this community. And I feel like having more material like that out there based in those communities to address specifically what we can do about this issue is what helps people move to action. So, you know, when I first saw that we act um, a while back, uh, there's, a, there's a running joke because I lived on, I, li I live on 152nd Street and at Edgecombe Avenue and at that time in 2007, the, there was really no people, of, basically everyone of color who lived there. And as I worked at WEAC, and as we continue to clean up the, the neighborhoods and the community and fight against a sewer treatment plan and close the as if you're coming into somebody's home for the first time. You don't walk into somebody's home and say, this coffee table doesn't belong here. Get rid of this couch. No, you need this TV on the wall. That's not how you walk into somebody's home. You treat it with respect and you find out what community is involved in and follow community leadership. It's also, I would invite community folks here who have lived for decades, if not all their lives, in this community to get on your community boards. I've gone to a couple of communities. meetings, I think it's the duty of the community board folks to make outreach their number one priority. What I'm struck by, and I can use my block as, <clears throat> as an example of what's going on, is the divide that's taking place between race and class and the income groups, not only in my block, but I suspect in other, in other blocks and in other uh, blocks within the community. Uh, what we have on our block are different institutions that are being established for those who've come in so that we will find that there's a French school, there's a So we can have a fish fry on our street, and down at one end of the street, you might find one person, and then you'll see something else going on on the other end of the street, like a, uh, a, a, a soiree going on at a house, 
and you will find that this, it's all of one color at that soiree. And what bothers me the most is really this divide that takes place in the community, in which there's no conversation between those who have come in to our community and those who have existed in our community. And I think one of the major challenges is not necessarily the community board, but finding other mechanisms whereby these conversations can be good. Anyone else want to take on that conversation? Okay. And it was it was about demographic change in the community. So um, I just want to I want to put to the to the I would like to bring it to everyone's attention that gentrification did not just start now. We're looking at 20, 30 years in, in, in the past. If we look at Harlem when they first tried. itself is worth a trillion dollars. 346 developments, 177,000 units, a lot of it is beachfront property. We're not, that, that's just NYCHA. We have other properties outside of NYCHA that, that fits that protocol as well that's being gentrified. It is to weaken the community, to make their agenda easier to accomplish. So I just want to put that to the consciousness. So I just want to kind of bring it, we bring it back a little bit because we are an environmental to justice organization. All right, and I understand that a lot of this stuff has to do with, you know, the relocation and the uh, of the, of the uh, gentrification, but how can we, as environmental organization, as you guys know about environmental justice, how can we uh, change the political uh, projection on uh, this as an environmental, as, as environmental movement? How do we tie this into the environmental movement? Gentrification. Does anyone help me out with that? Well, gentrification is that causes a lot of health issues, right? Uh, environmental issues in regards to like lead and, and, and the the global warming, the climate impact. We've seen Sandy hit New York City and devastated New York City in many in many area coastal areas. And so now, much like how we see seen happen in Katrina, with, with with so many people that were affected in Katrina and were displaced. And then gentrification comes through and further that displacement. Now, so now people don't have access to health, health care. They don't have access to the social networks. They don't have access to the same opportunities that they had before. Um, what we need to do is we need to put a focus on centering those pieces, stabilizing those pieces for our community, for our families, to make sure that another, the next hurricane that comes in, the next heat wave that comes in and may may, may uh, affect or kill, they say about 2030 to 2050, 95,000 people will die from the heat wave, right? So now these are conditions that we have to counteract and we have to have the foresight to address. Right. So in saying that, how can the, the reinvestment of NYCHA will help that, right? So if these, if people come into NYCHA and reinvest, because obviously the government's not going to do that. Right? So how do we um, take a stand on getting that reinvestment money, but also saving the people that we love and care for who live in that? Because obviously that the last 20 years, no one has actually reinvested it, right? So the, all the money's coming in now, right? So how do we make those things happen and stay in that and stay in that? So there's, since in 1988, there was uh, the Community Development Act, which put into place um, and amended the Housing Act of 1937, which was what public housing was built on during the New Deal, that gave residents the access to home ownership. Under Section 21, management home ownership opportunities, and Section 32, which is home ownership opportunities uh, with public housing authorities. And so that means every unit. This rag that they're bringing in Right, this money that you're talking about that is coming in, this is corporate welfare. <laughs> this is corporate welfare. So now this is corporations benefiting off of climate change. Like, 
Hurricane uh, Sandy, or what was it, Tropical Storm Sandy, right? And, and now they're getting Section 8 for the units when we can get equity. So we're talking about NYCHA in and of itself, 177,000 units, but throughout the country you have 1.3 million units of public housing that the residents of public housing can now own their apartments and but, gain that equity. And that's great, but do, they don't have the money to be invested in. So how do we, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be being you tied to the team, so there's a bunch of people here, so I don't wanna do that. So let, let me just clear that up with the money. I have residents in my development, one resident's paying $1,900 for her apartment. So now, with a mortgage on that apartment, it would significantly reduce her rent at 30% of her of her income and be able to manage and reinvest in her apartment. And not only that, because with the Section 21, we will be able to now couple or, or partner with other outside entities to bring in capital. The same way that this particular program works now, that's going to give corporate welfare to these private developers, we're able to do it and bring it in to the benefit of our people to make sure that they don't get displaced, to make sure that we have community networks in place, such as health care and, and other necessities that we need to build a stronger community. Okay. Do you want to add something, Dennis? All right. There you, go. you know, there's this conception that uh, people living in NYCHA pay nothing. And in terms of what the rent really is, for instance, when you give that number of $1,900 uh, a month, most people don't realize that will support a mortgage of $420,000. And I just want to put that into perspective so that people rethink the whole concept of when we think about people being able to own and to, and to be able to be part of the, that wealth building, that it's not impossible. Because few people think about it in terms of today's interest rates, 1900 bucks, I can go out and buy something for 450000 So, in this movie, Dante, I wanted to bring it back to you, uh, you talk about climate change and how that is affecting uh, California and the Bay Area. Can you uh, elaborate how you've uh, uh, made that uh, connection to uh, gentrification and climate change? Well, in this particular documentary, uh, The North Pole, it's based in North Oakland. And that's the place that's currently being gentrified at this moment. And in North Oakland, they call it the North Pole. And so they connected, well, we connected the idea of what's going on with the polar bears and, and out there on the ice with what's going on here. Because of what's going on with the climate, uh, environmental, the fires and stuff like that is going on over in California in the Bay Area. That smoke, everything is heating up. And so that not only helps, um, I mean, that, that, that not only causes asthma with the smoke, and with, with the particular lead that's in the housing, public housing, but also it also affects the animals. And so comparing the people in North Oakland with animals in like a safari is how we started off talking about it's, it's the same thing. What we're doing to the planet is the same thing that's happening to people of low income, if that makes sense. That does make sense. Um, Anna, can you talk about the, uh, the work that you're doing with GGJ and how you can, uh, how you're combining gentrification and climate change and just give me a, a better picture of that. Sure. Grassroots Global Justice Alliance is an alliance of 60 grassroots base building organizations across the country. And as I mentioned before, WE Act is a member. So our members are organizations, they're not individuals. And our members span the gamut of social justice issues. We have several environmental and climate justice organizations in New York, in California, across the country. And we also have organizations focused on anti-displacement, and that is their mission for existing. We also have organizations that work around immigrant rights and economic justice. And so there's a lot of overlap and intersectionality between the issues that all of our members work on. And part of the reason that members are drawn to grassroots global justice is because of our intersectional approach to our struggle for social justice. So if the root cause of climate change is also the root cause of displacing low-income communities of color, we have to merge forces. We have to join forces in our resistance to displacement and join forces in our demand for climate justice. And 
the previous question was about connections between climate justice and gentrification. When we look at New York specifically, and we think about the fact that New York is now susceptible to hurricanes. I am almost 40. This was not a thing I worried about when I was a kid and grew growing up. I have lived very close to the water my whole life. Never afraid of flooding or hurricanes until later in my life. And this is something that we have to think about now. And the city is developing accordingly and trying to propose climate solutions along the waterfront, but we have to be aware that when the climate catastrophe hits, because we're going to be hit with more floods, we are a city of islands, displacement is the aftermath of the immediate climate crisis. The communities hit hardest by Superstorm Sandy are still displaced permanently. Communities out in the Rockaways, families have not been able to move back in their homes. And um, the brother over here also mentioned Hurricane Katrina in 2005. People were permanently displaced from their communities in 2005. I went for the first time in 2010 at the anniversary, five years later after Katrina, and saw brand new homes with new people living in those communities who were not there, who did not live there prior to the hurricane. And so this is a tool that politicians and developers use. They just sit back, wait for the climate crisis to happen, and then they swoop in. Um, to develop those places that have been affected. And so it is of utmost importance that we merge forces, those of us who are involved in anti-displacement struggles and those of us who are involved in the demand for climate justice, because they are interrelated and they are both our struggles. Anybody want to follow up on that question? Okay, I'll go to my... Go ahead. I think, I think what happens is these ideas are really great until we figure out, are we going to wait for the government? I think that's a really important question right now at this political moment. We are coming up on a presidential election year next year. And whether we like it or not, the president has a lot of influence on, on what happens on policies. And there is sometimes a tendency within social justice movements to um, practice absenteeism when it comes to the electoral process of feeling like the two parties represent the same thing, so why bother? I think in this political moment, uh, we have to challenge ourselves to step more into the mainstream political arena and bring in our political knowledge 
and our political priorities and take back the conversation, take back the debate, ensure that the candidates running against 45 speak to our political priorities. We have to be setting the political agenda and they have to respond to us because they work for us. They do not work for the corporations that pay for their campaigns. And so one of the, like I was saying before, grassroots global justice offers an intersectional analysis to social justice movements. We understand that all of our members, whether they work for immigrant rights or for economic justice or for climate justice, all of our members are part of the movement for justice and are part of the movement against the systems of oppression. And those systems are oppression, I will name them, are very simply capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, colonialism, imperialism. And so when we understand that we are all up against those forces, anybody who is not a part of the 1% is up against those forces, we will realize that together we are bigger than them and we will realize our power. That is the one and only thing that terrifies them and keeps them up at night. You know, it's interesting what, you, what you've just described. Uh, there's a parallel model going on in Harlem. Because when we talk about the households, uh, the, the homeowners, and we talk about their wealth, they represent 3% of the population in all of Harlem. So by representing the population of all Harlem, how do we get those people involved? How do we have them um, understand that we are a community and now that they're a part of it, how do we get them involved? You know? Can we figure that out there? I can give an example of what we're trying to do in the food sphere in terms of our Corbin Hill Food Project. <clears throat> We've set up something called the Social, Invest, uh, Social Investment Fund, in which shareholders for our CSA, as most people would know it, which we call the farm share. And while we're here, let's talk about just Corbin Hill real quickly. To Corbin, Hill, Corbin, Hill, Corbin Hill Road uh, Food Project has been in existence for eight years. We were founded by 11 people, 64% uh, of those of that group are immigrants, 72% are made up of blacks and Latinx, and 52% uh, and from women, among uh, being women. And so that equity that we put up basically sort of drives the values of this organization, just given this composition, because we are not dependent upon foundation money or government money that would dictate to us what our values would be. Uh, but what we have discovered is the fact that, quite frankly, there are enough affluent at least 70 people who have participated in it and it's been able to support close to 400 people in our community who need subsidies in order to get food. And let me see this as a glimmer of hope. It's a beginning step in terms of what else exists in terms of wealth in this community and how we can build that kind of bond. Anybody over here like to add to that? So, we're almost here. We are now at the you know, last last couple of minutes. So, can you guys explain to me um, what you guys plan on doing to help us combat these um, environmental issues and gentrification issues that are facing us in closing? Um, I know that we talked a lot about different things. Um, we act is I, I had to put my plug in here. So, any of you guys are out here who aren't members. Please become members because the only way to build power is people of people with people power, right? So the only way we can do that is to join our organization and understand the work that we do, volunteer, come to our meetings, get educated. That way we can continue to fight for the things that are important for us. We do have a great uh, organization, and I hope that you guys who aren't in members, who haven't paid your or who aren't members who haven't paid your union your membership dues, please do so today. All right? All right, I just want to make sure that we get this clear. Because without all of us standing together and supporting each other, we're going to be divided. And that's always happens, right? No one person can defend a whole team of people. 
So if we don't become a team ourselves, we can't defend ourselves, right? We can't compete against those that 3%, right? If we don't have the 97% together, we can't beat the, the 3%. We have all the resources in the world, right? So we have to join the organization, be a part of an organization, make sure we participate in the organization, and do the things that we need to make sure we put policies in place that make sure that it helps us and not destroy us. So in closing, uh, does anybody want to have any last, uh, last things I'd like to say tonight on this issue? Um, no, Anna is exactly right. Um, community boards are ground zero for gentrification in your community. Um, to, to combat most of these issues that Manny brought up also, you have to be a part of something. Be a part of something. How do we stop some of this stuff going on? We all have to rally around common issues. We all have to use our economic power and, and do not support companies that's suppressing us, that's putting us in this, this situation, this position. So we all have to, a unified front, it has to be unified. I, I posted something on Instagram the other day, is these companies that are supportive of Trump and the NRA and all of these other things. I'm talking about Chick-fil-A and Subway, and these are places that we go to. We have to stop patronizing these businesses. They will wake up when, when their bottom line is going down. Money is going to drive a lot of these capitalists, a lot of these white nationalists. It's going to be the money issue. So I know me and Nan, I'm trying to, we're starting in a process of using our economic power to stop turning on the TV to watch certain shows, to stop spending money in certain stores, certain restaurants to eat. And it's not about buy black. When we was growing up, it's buy black. It's going to be do not buy from those who's going to hurt us. Um, and that will change the whole dynamic. Be a part of the community boards. Don't be afraid to donate to an elected official that has your best interest at heart. If people are donating to... and it's multi-layered and multi-generational so just being aware of what's going on and as an artist highlighting that and also just being around those who know more than me so I can just sharpen up my tools on what I do as an artist and I think that's what that's what I want to leave with so I thank y'all for having me and being a part of this panel discussion Wesley Carter Wesley Carter now now I had I am a founder of Occupy Nature that we are moving on some of these issues and educating the uh, residency as well as the general public of these opportunities that we have here. This is to combat this gentrification, climate gentrification. We have many developments that was affected by uh, Sandy. Also, and to, to your point, with, with, when it comes down to politics, our, our forefathers died to get us access to vote. But that was a battle and that was not the war. So our next phase is to learn how to vote, how, how to vote. It's not about going in there and circling a bubble.
Social change, how we equate this to social change, I, I equate this to the revolution, to the revolution of this country. Because you know what? They're they have our homes in jeopardy. Our shelter, our food, everything that we need to survive is in jeopardy at this moment. We are fighting to survive. And so we need to make sure that we understand that and put that urgency there. We don't have that urgency. To your point, how do we get that 97%? Everybody is like frogs in the, in, the, in the pot. I don't know if you've seen Inconvenient Truth, but they say you put a frog in a pot and you boil it, the frog will stay there until it dies. Let's not be the frog in the pot. So I will conclude and say we got a fight on our hands and a lot of us don't know we in the fight. This is really a struggle about ownership, sovereignty, and this whole concept that we have to shift decision-making power and begin to have that decision-making in our own hands. A good example is in food. A study was just done the last 10 years of policies, 300 policies came out around food to impact on low-income folks in this city, and never one in any of those particular 301 policies with the community given a decision-making power. And the outcome of it all is nothing has changed 10 years later around diabetes or any of the health measures that we would like. In other words, we don't own those decisions. We have to start owning them if it's going to make a difference. And we have to start shifting the power in terms of the election and who we vote for, and in many different ways in taking control over that decision-making. It is about us as a community owning that decision-making power. Thank you. I would just echo some of what's already been said in the closing remarks that I would encourage folks here, if you're not already a member of WEACT, join WEACT. Be involved in your community organization that is resisting displacement and also demanding climate justice and fighting the climate crisis. And if folks are interested in engaging with grassroots global justice, that would be through WEACT, through our member organizations. Like I said, our members are organizations, our members are not individuals, and that was a strategic choice in the founding of GGJ to ensure that anybody we're connected with is already connected to their local fights in their own communities. And we offer political education tools that we send out to our members that can then be shared out to the members of our members. almost no stopping them unless we resort to new and very different tactics, radical tactics, to defend our communities, to defend our homes. So, um, I'd like everyone to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, we do have a second part of our agenda, which is a movie at the North Pole. Um, so, we're going to make a little small transition in just a couple of minutes. Um, please give the, all the panelists a hand again. They've done a wonderful job.